Zenlin and Baldwin Optical, and we're excited to present Zenlens to you tonight. Uh, joining me uh, will be uh, uh, Dr. Jason Jedlicka. Jason's the owner of the direct and director of the Contact and Cornea Lens Institute in Minneapolis. He's currently the president of the Scleral Lens Education Society, and he's served as a consultant for many of the most notable contact lens manufacturers uh, in the country. Uh, Jason is the co-designer of ZenLens, and it was a it was a pleasure to work with Jason to uh, to bring ZenLens to market. Um, John Davis is going to be joining you, uh, going through primarily the fitting philosophy and uh, tips and tricks to fit ZenLens. Uh, uh, John is a member uh, of the Alden Optical team. He's our senior product director. He um, uh, he serves primarily in a consultative role uh, for some of the more difficult fit scenarios. But he brings to the table a tremendous amount of experience, including uh, many years as the general manager of Hirschloff Contact Lens Lab in Wisconsin, where he also served uh, in a role that it was involved in hands-on specialty fitting and seven years at Synergize. So we're, we're thrilled to have John uh, with us at Alden Optical, and I'm sure you'll enjoy his presentation tonight. And last but not least, Dr. Bruce Baldwin is going to present two cases uh, uh, on Zen Lens. Um, towards the end of the presentation, Dr. Baldwin's a 28-year veteran of the U.S. Air Force. Uh, he is currently the, uh, he directs the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill Contact Lens Clinic with an emphasis on specialty and medical fits. And Dr. Baldwin also consults with a number of manufacturers in the industry. Neither Dr. Baldwin or Dr. Chedlick have any financial interest in Zen Lens. Uh, and with that, uh, we, will, uh, we will move on. John, can you advance to the next slide? Well, oh, there we go. Okay, so really quick what we're going to try and accomplish tonight, we're going to discuss what problems Alden and Dr. Jedlicka were attempting to solve with the design, and what kinds of things that he's seen in his practice, a heavily scleral oriented practice, uh, what kinds of things that he was he hoping to, uh, to solve. As I mentioned before, we're going to review the fitting philosophy, and then between Dr. Jedlicka and Dr. Baldwin, we're going to describe three interesting cases that demonstrate Zen Lens and its unique attributes. Along the way, we'd like to engage in good discussion. Um, you can please feel free to type any questions in your question box. We're going to try and answer those as we break from presenter to presenter. Um, so we'll make sure that we get to your questions. We're probably not going to interrupt the flow of uh, one presenter's uh, segment, but uh, we, will, we will do our best to get to all the questions. So please type the questions in as they come to your mind uh, and know that we will uh, we'll do, our, again, our best to get to them at the appropriate uh, juncture. Um, and then last but not least, I'll offer you the opportunity to start fitting Zen Lens with a promotional offer on the 24 lens diagnostic set. So with that, I will turn this over to Dr. Jedlicka. All right. Thanks, Tom. So thanks, everybody, for being here. It's great to have a good number of you here interested in this product. And so I'm going to take the first uh, little section tonight to talk about what some of our goals were with fitting or designing this lens. Um, when Tom first approached me with the idea of helping Alden come up with a scleral lens design a little over a year ago, um, I said I would be interested in that um, I had some very specific ideas from my experience working with sclerals that I would want to see a new design or a new fitting set try to address. And um, a lot of those issues that I had came from talking to people who were beginning the process and also some of my frustrations that I had with other designs as a, a more advanced fitter. So we're going to try to address both making it simple and comprehensive enough for, for um, everybody to use and so that we can get by with a single fitting set instead of relying on multiple sets for different indications. So, you know, the question is how can you, how can a single scleral lens work on nearly any eye? And, a lot of the fitting sets out there have many lenses, and when we fit scleral lenses, a lot of times we jump from one lens to a lens multiple steps across in the fitting set. And it occurred to me that we just have a lot of lenses we don't necessarily need in a lot of our fitting sets. So if we could compress the, um, the number of lenses we had in any given fitting set, we could kind of simultaneously get multiple sets into one fitting set. So it's kind of what we, we approached is that we wanted to try to compress the idea of the lens for the keratoconic cornea or the steep cornea as well as the reverse oblate cornea into a single fitting set that, that we didn't have to move from one fitting set to another to fit different 
types of eyes. Next slide, please. So um, you will see as we go through the, the webinar tonight that the Zen lens is made so that it does accommodate the steep keratoconic cornea as well as those relatively normal shaped but perhaps sick ocular surface disease corneas as well as the flat post-refractive cornea, a wide array of graft cornea shapes as well as small diameter and large diameter corneas and not only to fit them but to fit them ideally. To achieve these goals of being able to fit this wide range of eyes with one fitting set, um, the first attribute we wanted to go for was to have different diameters within the same fitting set. And this was to accommodate both smaller and larger corneal diameters. We want the scleral lens to land on the scleral, sclera at a specific area beyond the limbus. In order to achieve that properly, we need to do calculations and we need to get the lens to land in a certain area and still have enough landing area on the sclera to distribute the bearing and provide a comfortable, well-positioned fit. So um, after much hashing out of, of what we thought would be ideal diameters, we decided to choose a 16 and a 17 as our two standard diameters within the fitting set. And it's very simple. We just strictly based it on corneal diameter. So if you have some capability of measuring corneal diameter, topographer, or any other instrument, or even a reticule, um, we generally recommend that corneas around 11.7 or smaller are better fit with the 16 millimeter design and the 11.8 or larger in the larger design. And um, that is the first fitting step as you'll see when John goes through this in a moment. So once we've accomplished the idea of fitting both large and small diameter corneas, we then also wanted to accommodate the steep cornea as well as the flat cornea. And so we've again divided the set up into two basic sets within the set. One is for the steep prolate shaped cornea and one is for the flat oblate shaped cornea. And just because a lens is designed for an oblate or prolate cornea doesn't mean the lens itself does or does not have reverse curves in it, for example. So I would have you not get hung up on the idea that um, a prolate cornea um, is only prolate curves. There may be reverse curves in there to accommodate the fit of the eye. We would just have you think about it in terms of if you're fitting a cornea that is prolate, then we want to use the prolate series. If you're fitting a cornea which is oblate or flatter centrally and steeper in the mid periphery, then we want to use the oblate series of lenses. So this is kind of the, the design we ended up with for our diagnostic set and you can basically see what you've got are four series of lenses. You have the prolate and oblate two individual series and then you have the larger 17 millimeter and the smaller 16 millimeter design and the fitting process again revolves around narrowing it down to which of these rows of six lenses is going to be optimal for that patient and then within that row of six lenses optimizing that fit. So again this is a patient uh, of mine who I fitted out of my fitting set, Zen Lens fitting set and you can see she's got a, a very steep cornea so she obviously has keratoconus and um, so out of my fitting set I was able to fit this patient very successfully with a uh, prolate series lens um, directly from the fitting set, put a lens on, address the fit, make minor modifications and order. Next slide please. Um, again, here's a very different cornea shape. Here's a patient who's had uh, ocular trauma, ended up with corneal transplant, has a, a, a flat, flatter central cornea, quite irregular with a very steep periphery or mid-periphery. Again, out of the very same fitting set, we were able to ideally fit a lens to this eye. As you see the two pictures down below, the one on the left is in white light, shows you just the peripheral fit and the um, the picture on the lower right shows you the fluorescein pattern. Um, both of these patients, again, using Zen lenses, Zen lenses fit out of that same 24 lens fitting set with optimal fit, vision, and comfort. So um, getting past the, the concept of being able to fit 
any type of eye. We also then wanted to make the lens itself easy to fit once you're going through the fitting process. So attribute number three was to make adjustments simple and easy and don't affect the entire lens fit when I want to make something different about the lens. So if I want something changed, I want to ask for the change and I want that to change and nothing else. I also don't want to get my change through some backdoor method, if you will. Like if I need something changed, I'm going to have to change other parameters in order to get that. And so, um, for example, these are just two examples which you may have encountered in, in fitting scleral lenses, but um, if we have a, a, I may order from a lab and say I need a more limbal clearance for my fit. And they'll say, that's great, we can do that. And just so you know, you're going to pick up another 125 microns of central clearance in order to achieve that limbal clearance. Well, I don't want that. Well, I'm sorry, but that's just how the design works. So that's a frustration. Um, by the same token, other times we've ordered lenses and say, I need this lens to clear the limbus a little more. And I, they would, I would be told, that's fine. We just need to increase the overall diameter by half a millimeter. And I might say, I don't want it half a millimeter larger. Well, I'm sorry, but that's how we achieve increased limbal clearance. So you'll see how we put the lens together to avoid these um, backdoor methods of getting the change you want and give you the real change you want. So again, if I want limb more limbal clearance, I want to be able to get it and not change anything else in the process. And so we want to make that very simple, again, for the beginner who doesn't have a lot of experience, um, but also leave the option open for the advanced fitter to work with consultation to um, completely customize the lens from time to time. So the final two attributes that we wanted to bring to this design were a generous scleral landing area because this provides good comfort and it provides an aligned fit that doesn't create issues with blanching or compression. And so um, having fitted scleral lenses for many years, I just came to believe that certain amounts of compression or tightness in areas were just par for the course and had to be accepted with scleral lenses. But I think you find when you work with a Zen lens that you'll be surprised at how nice the, uh, the scleral landing area does align to the eye. And there are many ways which you can individualize that, again, to optimally fit eyes. The fifth part of it is to um, kind of make the whole concept of toricity in scleral lenses much simpler to use for, again, maybe more of a novice to a, a mid-level fitter so that adding toric peripheral landing curves, for example, or ordering um, toric optic zone on the anterior surface to correct residual astigmatism was actually quite easy and not such a challenge or a guessing game when we came to doing that. So I think you'll again find as we go through the fitting that we have achieved a lens which allows you to incorporate toricity into the fit and visual components in a very successful, simple manner. So the basic lens design, if you look at the little screenshot here we have from a lens design software, you essentially have four zones worth considering. The central area, the base curve, and then we have outside of the base curve another area we just call the smart curve. And the smart curve is what allows the lens to adapt to make changes in one regard without affecting other aspects of the fit. The limbal clearance curve is then outside of that. And at the very outside of the limbal clearance curve, we are landing at the sclera. The APS, or the peripheral curve system, is actually a three-curve series, which is proprietary and allows us to um, optimally fit the eye. Those individual curves, again, we would generally ask that we're, we we don't manipulate them individually, that we allow you to manipulate them, but you use our system for doing that in a simple fashion. So getting back to how the smart curve works, just wanted to um, show you an example. Uh, if you look at the diagram here, and you look into the zone with the LCC or the limbal clearance curve, you, what you see there is you see a red, black, and a green line. And these are three different possible limbal clearance angles. The, uh, the, different, the different lines indicate a, a steeper or flatter or standard limbal clearance. And in order to change between those different limbal clearance curves, the SMART curve, as you see, adapts to meet that change, but to bring the lens back into alignment at the beginning of the base curve and at the beginning of the APS so that while you change the limbal clearance, the SMART curve adapts, but the base curve and APS don't have to change, the diameter doesn't have to change, 
the uh, overall SAG doesn't have to change. You effectively get the change where you want it and no, with no other change necessary. Um, final note here, the advanced peripheral system again is simply a system of changing this series of three curves in unison to provide optimal fit. And rather than have you worrying about how many diopters or whatnot you want to change, the APS is set up so that you can simply order them in increments of one, two, three, four, five steep, one, two, three, four, five flat or standard, or any combination thereof to get a toric effect. You can combine a three flat with a two steep to give you uh, a lens which fits that eye optimally. So at that, um, this is the basic concept of the lens, what we were trying to do, again, to make it simple to fit, yet very comprehensive, so that literally when someone says, what lens can I use, this is a set that you can have in your office and you really shouldn't need any other sets to, in order to fit the vast majority of patients. Thank you, Dr. Jablecka. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if anybody's got any uh, questions uh, regarding that. Has anybody, uh, Tom, has anybody typed in any questions? Yeah, John, we have, we have no questions at the moment. Again, okay. I'd encourage folks to type in their questions and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take them as they come. Very good. Well, what we're, we're going to do right now is basically just go through uh, a quick review of the fitting guide. Uh, more or less the fitting process with the Zen lens, uh, cover some of this territory that Dr. Jedlicka just uh, just uh, explained. And uh, as we go through that, and then we'll get some case histories after this. So uh, let's start uh, again as uh, the first the first step in the, the fitting process uh, uh, is going to be, well, first off, what we need to achieve is essentially the same, the same three primary requirements of any scleral lens, those of you who are used to fitting scleral lenses will be familiar with this. Uh, number one, we're trying to vault completely over the cornea. That's the whole idea of a scleral lens, take the corneal irregularities out of play. Um, we have 300 micron increments in our diagnostic set uh, to, uh, to work with, uh, but as, uh, as was explained, that can be adjusted. Uh, secondly, we're looking to make sure we're clearing the limbus. We don't want the lens bearing uh, on the limbal stem cell area, uh, so we have to look for the limbal clearance, and then finally a good scleral alignment. So those are our three uh, primary cr criteria for a successful fit, and this is how we uh, go about achieving it. So this is what the diagnostic set will look like. Uh, again, you have four mini sets, as we call them, uh, each row comprising its own uh, its own lens design. And your first uh, first objective in fitting is to decide which of those rows uh, you're going to use. So um, as you've already seen, choose a diameter based on corneal diameter or HVID. Essentially, anything that's average to below average will go with a 16 millimeter design. When you get up to average or larger, you can use a 17 millimeter design. Probably those corneas that are 11.6 to 11.9 could probably work with uh, either design if you have uh, uh, concerns about palpebral fissure and things like that. Um, uh, one thing to uh, point out, the, each of the diagnostic lenses have uh, drill dot markings, which will, uh, uh, there are six markings in a circular, uh, a concentric circle around the periphery of the lens uh, to mark the beginning of the landing zone, where that APS system begins. Uh, in other words, the end of the vault zone. So we're looking for that, that, those lens markings to land beyond the limbus, ideally a half a millimeter to a millimeter maybe a millimeter and a half beyond the limbus. Uh, in that range, that will uh, provide enough clearance that the vault zone will completely avoid that limbal area without it becoming excessively large. So uh, we start by choosing the corneal di the lens diameter, and then, as was explained, use a prolate uh, shape for the prolate-shaped corneas, oblate lens for the oblate-shaped corneas. And this is a good way to determine uh, what type of uh, cornea you're dealing with. If you have topography, I like the elevation map, which is shown here. You can see if there's a relative to a spherical, uh, hypothetical spherical surface, if there's more elevation in the periphery, uh, like we see here, that would be an indication you're going to want more clearance in the periphery than a spherical shape. So you would use the oblate design. This particular cornea is about a 12, just a little over 12 millimeter uh, diameter. 
So in this particular case, you'd use the 17 millimeter uh, uh, oblate uh, shape. This is another uh, cross section that, that kind of shows you the difference, what, why you're choosing an oblate versus a prolate shape. This is um, two lenses um, that would, if they both had the 4900 micron sag, the oblate lens is outlined in red and the prolate lens with the same sag is uh, shown in the blue lines. And you can see the main difference is the oblate lens has a flatter base curve, um, so it doesn't curve back toward the cornea as quickly as the prolate shape does. And the smart curve then steepens to provide that additional sagittal depth necessary to maintain the same, the same central clearance. So essentially what you see here is a difference where the oblate lens shows, uh, in this case, probably about 300 microns of excess of, uh, not excess of, more clearance than what you would see with the prolate. Uh, depending on the corneal shape, it could be excess, in which case then you would move to the prolate shape. And then this again, it's the design configuration. So once you've chosen your, your uh, which row you're going to be working with, in our example, we were using a 17 millimeter oblate design. I usually grab something pretty close to the middle to start with. Um, and uh, if, if you know you've got a lens that's uh, got extreme uh, protrusion, you can move over a little bit further to the right. But essentially, you just need to start somewhere. The average sag value um, through most of our orders is typically pretty close to this third column down. And then once you put a lens on, then you start the evaluation to see if you need to uh, choose a, a different sag value. So again, these are the three components you're looking for. The first thing we're looking for is central clearance. If you see central touch like this, obviously you're going to need to go to a deeper, a deeper lens. So you move uh, one or two columns over to the right. With this much touch, I'd probably move over two columns to the right and then put a lens on. Once you've achieved central clearance, then you need to try to assess just how much central clearance you have. And the best method for that, short of uh, OCT, if you have that, that's wonderful. Uh, if not, the cross-section of the slit beam is a, is a good way to uh, evaluate the thickness. So we do have, um, if you can see the, uh, make sure you can see my arrows here. You can see the central, th the central tier layer is highlighted in fluorescein with the blue light. You can see the lens itself, the thickness of the lens in front of that. And all of the diagnostic lenses have a, center thickness of 0.35 millimeters, or 350 microns. And this is uh, uh, very convenient because that's a pretty good uh, point, point to aim for when you're doing your initial fitting to try to get about 350 microns of tear layer thickness. So something pretty uh, approximately the same thickness as the lens. We're approaching it here. It's a little bit thinner up top. So we've got maybe two to 300 microns of clearance with this lens. If you go to the next deeper lens from the set, from the Z8 to the Z9, uh, in this particular case. Uh, now you can see you've got about uh, tear layer thickness almost equal to the cornea. You can see the corneal thickness in this light gray area back here. So here, from top to bottom, it's probably more like uh, 500 to, to maybe 600 microns of clearance. Uh, you may easily decide that you want something uh, between the two, so maybe you would order 4,700 microns. Um, we do want to assume that like all scleral lenses, this lens will settle a bit over time. Um, so uh, you want to make sure you, you don't cut it too close. Ideally, we're typically looking for something in the um, 100. Most practitioners are liking at the end of the day, after the lens is fully settled, uh, at least 100 microns, maybe 100 to 250, somewhere in that range. So let's say you wanted to order something with 100 more microns or less microns than your diagnostic lens. Go ahead and over-refract with what you've got. And then you just specify the sag value that you want to order. And what you can see here, again, because of the smart curve technology, uh, the base curve doesn't have to change. All that's going to change, the smart curve will simply steepen or flatten, depending whether you're increasing or decreasing the amount of sag. In this diagram, the black line, it's kind of hard to see the colors, but the black line indicates the uh, standard 4800. If you wanted 4700, simply order that, and the entire base curve will drop down. The entire central optic zone, nine, nine and a half millimeters of that, 
of that lens will simply drop down to that lower sag value or move up if you're increasing the sag. So you don't have to make compensation to the lens power when you change the sag. So that's an important, this important point, that the sag is not dependent on base curve. Sometimes doctors who are working with other scleral lenses will simply call in and say, I need a steeper base curve. And, and then the question is, well, is that because you need more central clearance? And if the answer is yes, then we need to increase the sag value. That's how you gain more central clearance. And if you want to change the base curve as well, we can do that. Uh, and there's sometimes there's, there's reasons to do that. But uh, uh, changing the base curve alone does not necessarily change the sag unless you've specified the new sag value that you want. So once you've got your central clearance where you uh, at a value that seems appropriate, the next thing you're looking for is that limbal clearance. So you can see in this photo on the left that there's a pretty uh, fair amount of bearing in that peripheral cornea and at the limbus. Um, so uh, you can steepen the limbal clearance curve. Um, if you like, or you can, uh, it is possible if you look at those diagnostic drill dots that show you where the APS uh, landing zone begins. If that landing zone is beginning right at the limbus or, or even inside the limbus, then, then that would be a, a clue that you need to go to a larger diameter lens, which was the case here. Because that bearing, you can see, extends not just at the limbus, there's, there's touch pretty much uh, well within the uh, peripheral cornea. That's a good sign that you uh, may need a larger diameter. But if you were simply going to change, increase that limbal clearance, you've already uh, demonstrated this. Uh, the value is, is, is when you want to make a change is you don't have to tell us what curves you want. You tell us how many more microns or fewer microns of clearance you want in this limbal region. So this is an example um, uh, with, again, the black line indicating the standard limbal clearance curve. And if you wanted Let's say you wanted 160 more microns of clearance. That's, this is what would happen, is this curve would be recalculated by the software to generate the red line here, where it steepens, to generate 160 more microns at this particular point where the limbal clearance curve meets the smart curve. The smart curve adjusts to maintain the overall sag. The base curve doesn't have to change. So that's how you would specify uh, the limbal clearance uh, values. And, and this is just sort of a guideline. This is a question as well. If I'm seeing some touch, how do I know how many more microns uh, I, I need? Um, so typically, if you're seeing touch within one quadrant, um, usually just 50 microns, 50, 60 more microns is usually enough to uh, provide that clearance. You're going to see that extra uh, clearance 360 degrees around the limbal area. So you may not want to go more than necessary. Um, if you see that quadrant, uh, that area of touch within two quadrants approaching 180 degrees, um, most often it would be superiorly, uh, then you might want to add 100, 120 microns, something in that range. Um, as it extends beyond 180 degrees, uh, then you may have to increase the, uh, that limbal clearance curve by uh, maybe 150, 160 microns. Um, if it gets you know, much beyond 180 degrees, that's another sign to maybe reevaluate that landing zone uh, area where, where it's landing in relation to the limbus and maybe that you need to go to a larger diameter. So this is just another view, gives you another sort of perspective of, of what the lens uh, looks like and how those different curves and various areas relate to each other. So you can see that the uh, central optic zone is, covers the majority of the cornea. As you change the shape from a prolate to an oblate, it's this first circle out here. That's where you're going to see the biggest difference. You're going to see a lot more clearance in this area with, a, uh, with an oblate shape than you would with a, a prolate shape. And then the next curve is the smart curve, which is automatically adjusted to, in relation to your other changes. This, uh, this second circle out here would be the limbal clearance zone at the limbus. So when you steepen or flatten or add, add or subtract from the amount of uh, uh, limbal clearance that you want, that's where you're going to see that change get affected. And then the lens, of course, lands out here, hopefully about a half millimeter to a millimeter beyond the limbus, and then your APS system out here, which is also adjustable. Um, as Dr. Jedlick explained, five steps steep or five steps flat. Typically, looking for blanching of vessels, impingement if that edge is digging into the conge, you can flatten the edge. 
Um, each step is about a 30 micron adjustment. Well, it's exactly a 30 micron adjustment from the axial edge lift. Uh, 30 microns is, is enough to make, uh, to make a difference. It's not a huge change, but we, it is often sufficient. If you're just seeing, boy, it just kind of looks like it might be just a little tight, usually one step flat would be sufficient. Um, uh, if you um, if it looks like those bless vessels are blanching, you know rather rapidly and and fairly noticeably, you may want to go two steps or maybe even three steps flat. And then again, torque peripheral curves can be added um, by uh, by saying uh, let's go flat two in one meridian and maybe standard or steep one in the other meridian. So if you see uh, blanching of the vessels maybe just at the three and nine o'clock but everything looks good superiorly or inferiorly, you might just keep, decide let's keep the standard curve in one meridian and let's go flat two or flat three in the other meridian. So that will create uh, touristy in the, in the landing zone. And the lens will just pretty much automatically seek its, its proper spot when the patient inserts it. There will be some markings I'll explain in just a moment to, which do mark the, uh, the toric uh, peripheries. Once you've got the fit established, you've got your three criteria, good central clearance, good limbal clearance, and a nice alignment out on the, the square with the APS, uh, then simply over-refract. Uh, make sure you adjust if your uh, over-refraction is more than four diopters in, a, in, in the uh, opter. Um, uh, keep in mind, uh, or maybe I haven't mentioned yet, but each of the diagnostic lenses have a minus two power. Um, the, that was done primarily for the convenience of, of making each lens thickness that allowed us to make each lens with a 350 micron center thickness to make easy evaluation of the, the tear layer. So then uh, just factor in your, your minus two. Uh, if you're modifying the, the sagittal depth, again, you don't have to adjust. The base curve will just stay the same. So you don't need to adjust the lens power if you're changing size. If you find cylinder, in the over-refraction, then you, what you want to do is find out if this is due to lens flexure or is it perhaps lenticular internal astigmatism. So you want to use your uh, topography or, uh, or keratometry to, to see if the lens is flexure, to flexing to see if you get tericity uh, in, your, in your reading. Uh, if there is, then the first thing I would do is let's go take a look and try to figure out where is that tericity coming from. So you may want to look out, take another look at your APS at the edge and see if, if perhaps there's some tericity in the square that uh, maybe a, a toric uh, APS system in the landing zone might help to minimize or eliminate that flexure. So, uh, but if you look out there and everything looks yeah, pretty, pretty good, it, 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 the, the landing looks good at 360 degrees, um, you know, at least nothing that, that screams that you need toric peripheral curves, then the simplest thing is simply to uh, use a flex control option. Um, we use the uh, 100 micron increments. You, you could uh, change that, but essentially flex control one will increase the lens thickness uh, by 100 microns. Um, and notice that's a lens thickness, not central thickness. It, it, it increases the center thickness, but it increases that, that thickness um, profile throughout the entire lens, uh, all the way out to the to the landing zone and even incorporating uh, part of the landing zone, since that again is very often where the flexure originates. Um, we, wanted, we wanted to put that thickness more than just in the center of the lens. So that's a fairly effective option uh, for controlling uh, flexure as well. If there is no flexure, you still get per, uh, cylinder in your over refraction, but the lens isn't flexing, it tells you you've got uh, some kind of internal astigmatism. Uh, we do have front surface toric RXs available. Um, uh, it uses a, a dual elliptical stabilization system similar to, uh, to Alden's soft lenses and uh, it's working quite, quite well. So you would simply tell us what the over-refraction is and uh, we can put that in and uh, the lens will again orient itself with the thin zone sliding underneath the uh, upper and lower lids. I think Dr. Baldwin has an example of that coming up later in the, in the presentation. This is, uh, I mentioned the markings on the lens. This, this uh, picture on the left, uh, the, the image on the left, is what the diagnostic lenses would look like uh, without the red coloring. There's just simply drill dots that are put in the lens. And you can see there's six dots. And again, they mark the beginning of the landing zone, of the transition from the, where the vault zone ends and the landing zone begins. And that's where you want to see those dots uh, beyond the limbus. 
Um, when you order lenses, uh, we will put two dots in the same, the same location, uh, just so again, so you can kind of, uh, in evaluating the lens, if you're seeing things like lumbar bearing, uh, you may want to take another look and make sure that those lenses are landing uh, where, you th where you thought they were. Uh, of course, with the standard APS, those lenses, lens would be free to rotate, so those dots could end up, you know, lining any, along any axis. Um, if you do put torque peripheral curves in there, like we were talking about, let's say you go a, a flat three in a standard, um, the two dots will still, again, mark the beginning of the APS. They will be put on the flat meridian of the, uh, of the torque peripheral curve. Um, and then if you get involved with uh, front torque, uh, torque lens optics, um, then the markings become a little more advanced. And you can, uh, this is in your, in your fitting guide, uh, so you can review that. And uh, if you do have occasion to order a lens like that, fortunately we haven't had to see a whole lot of uh, torque lens designs. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly uh, give a call to consultation and, and uh, we'll help you uh, design those lenses and we'll uh, confirm how those markings are going to work for you. The parameters are uh, uh, very wide-ranging. Again, the whole idea was to fit pretty much any, any eye that you're likely to encounter. Um, so the, uh, the sagittal depth range is very complete, uh, uh, 50 micron steps. Actually, I think we can even order them in 10 micron steps if we wanted to, to really fine-tune uh, fine your, your clearance. Um, the two diameters, 16 and 17, we've talked about. Power is pretty much... Uh, uh, any power that you would be likely to need. Um, and then the edge profiles we've discussed, five flat to five steps steep, each step being 30 micron adjustment. And again, torque peripheral curves, flex control profile, custom thickness, custom torque RXs. Uh, our default material is the Boston XO in clear. Uh, we do have XO2 and we have ice blue as well. Uh, so if you want something, if you don't specify a material or color, uh, you're going to get the lens with the XO uh, in clear. Otherwise, let us know if you want something different than that. And then as far as ordering the lens, once you've done the, the fit, uh, give us a call at consultation, or you can, uh, you can email us, or you can fax the orders in. And uh, just let us know. There's a couple different ways. Some doctors like to order the lenses. One is to uh, simply specify uh, every parameter that you want. 16 millimeter prolate, 4,900 side. You can see the base curve, the lens power, standard APS. And if you wanted to change on limbal clearance, typically if you don't mention APS or limbal clearance, we assume you're going to keep the standard. The same thing as what you saw in your diagnostic lens. Some doctors will just say, this was the lens I tried on. I tried on the Z3 diagnostic lens, which happens to be the 4800 micron. But I want 100 more microns of clearance. Had a minus 250 over refraction, and give me plus 50 more microns of limbal clearance. So this is the same, you know, this is just two ways of ordering the same lens that you see here. The more information you give us, the happier I am when I take orders. So I don't have questions as to, I wonder what the doctor was looking for. So that's the, the basic fitting process. Uh, we think it's very simple, very straightforward. And uh, I think we'll show, uh, let uh, Dr. Jedlick and Dr. Baldwin show you uh, uh, some live examples. John, thank you. It's Tom back. Um, we will touch on lens pricing and the policy at the end of the presentation. So if you have questions about what the lens pricing is, we'll handle that in a little bit. Uh, any questions for John Davis, uh, type them in. We're, we're happy to take them. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Jedlicka. Okay. So um, I just have one case here, and I uh, wanted to keep this relatively simple and hopefully highlight how um, straightforward the process can be for fitting. So um, the, the patient in this case is a 42-year-old female with keratoconus, left eye more so than right. She has been previously fitted in other sclerals and worn them intermittently over a few years. She's currently having a hard time tolerating the comfort of her lens, and so she's not worn them for a few months. Her vision is good, um, but just the comfort is a problem, and there's no other considerations at this point. Um, this is just a picture of her topography. As you can see, again, the left eye more advanced than the right. Um, worth noting are the corneal diameters here slightly above 12, so a little bit larger. And again, that would indicate to us, first of, of all, in making our lens selection for fitting that we want the 17 millimeter design. 
the other um, number there are the SIMKs, and again, while this isn't uh, universal, it just kind of helps us know that we probably are going to want a deeper lens on the left eye than we will on the right, ultimately. So um, we go to our diagnostic set, and again, as I mentioned, we're probably in the prolate design because we have keratoconus, and we should be in the 17 millimeter diameter because of her corneal diameter. And because the keratoconus is moderate to advanced, we're probably not at the left end of the spectrum, so I would say, again, shooting for somewhere in the center. Um, this basically narrows down the process to about four lens choices, and that's all you have to really pick from. So again, just the process simple. Um, I picked the number 10 lens, um, which has the 5200 micron sagittal depth, and we put it on, and my first impression was it seemed a little bit shallow. So um, I went ahead, took it off, and put on the number 11 lens, which is a 5500, and looked pretty good. Again, I thought probably good fit, but maybe a little more sag than I needed. She was happy with the comfort, so good peripheral fit, no blanching, good vision with the overfraction, no flexure. Uh, so I ordered this lens, and I simply asked for 100 microns of less sag than the diagnostic lens that we put on. So uh, lens 11, 100 microns of decreased sag. And what we actually ordered again was a 5400, 170 minus 475 power with the standard peripheral curve system. Um, this is a picture. This is a picture of a lens on eye. I'm um, just going to give you an idea of what it looked like. Um, again, the peripheral curves, you don't see any kind of blanching or compression of the blood vessels. You can see, just even with the white light, the um, fluorescein underneath the lens. Next picture. Uh, apologize for the quality of this image, but again, I think it gives you the idea. Um, we've got a reasonably good fit overall. Our uh, brightest fluorescein extends beyond the limbus, and our peripheral curves lay down against the eye properly. The next slide will show our central sag. Um, and so again, here you can see um, the sagittal depth of the lens relative to the lens thickness. And you'll have to take my word for it when I say it's probably right around 350 to 400 microns. And uh, this is just a, a, a composite of two different images that I took to show you about where the markings were with the diagnostic lens that we put on eye. Um, so this is the number 11 lens that we eventually ordered based off of, and you can see that the little drill dots go and land beyond the limbus in the two quadrants that the images were taken in. So this is something to look for to make sure those drill dots land on the sclera. So again, with this lens, um, good comfort, fit, dispense the lens. Um, she came back two weeks later for a follow-up, wearing them full-time and very happy. Quality of vision is great. Um, no issues with comfort whatsoever. After letting the lenses settle, now I'm feeling like I should have probably stuck with the original sagittal depth I started with. So I had to reorder the lens with that extra 100 put back into it, but nothing else needed to change. And so this lens is currently what the patient is using, and again, it's very happy. Um, basically took two lenses to come up with our final fit. And for most of the time, I tell people when they want to fit a Zen lens, um, it really shouldn't take more than two lenses to come to your final uh, lens to order. Bruce? That's great. Thank you, Jason. Uh, we do have a couple questions. Uh, one of the attendees has asked if there's any preference regarding XO2 versus XO. Does anybody want to, any of our organizers want to take that one? Uh, I can certainly address that. Um, I typically, if the patient has um, keratoconus or um, any type of uh, any type of situation where neovascularization of the cornea is not necessarily an issue, I tend to just go with Boston XO. Um, in my post graft patients, um, any patient with neovascularization, maybe patients with intacts, because they tend to stimulate neovascularization, any situation where neo is a possible you know, issue that you might have arise, I would go with XO2. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, another question was, how long was ZenLens tested prior to launch? Um, I can take that as a summary. We started working with Jason uh, last uh, April, April 13. We went into, we did some preliminary work, some first cut designs between Jason and Charlie uh, in the fall of 13. And then in January, we launched our beta fitting with uh, eight or nine very seasoned scleral lens fitters. A couple of them are on the call tonight. 
Um, and John Davis, uh, how many eyes? Over 100 eyes, right? In beta? Well, John's, I think, muted. Sorry, I had to unmute uh, myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it was, I think we ended up with about 130. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So extensive testing uh, and, uh, and very, very good feedback in beta. So we we're very encouraged about the results we got in beta. Uh, since then, we've rolled it out to a handful of accounts in sort of a preview mode, and the, and the feedback from those folks has been great as well. Um, and one more question before we move on to Dr. Baldwin. That's, uh, Jason, why don't you take that if you don't mind. How long do you let the lens settle on the day of fitting? You know, um, that's a great question, and I think how you choose to do that is, is your own practice preference. In my practice, I, I know a lens is going to settle a certain amount. And so um, I would say that if a patient's coming into me and they're currently wearing sclera lenses, which means to me that their sclera and their conge are already kind of compressed a bit, um, then I'm not going to allow for as much compression. But if it's a fresh eye that has never worn a sclera, I'm going to allow for more. But I honestly, I don't, I don't have time in my practice to allow the lens to sit for a long period of time. I try to give it five to 10 minutes let things settle in, get stabilized, assess the, the vault, give myself a good 150 microns of, of leeway so that if my goal is I want to end up with 250 or 300, then I may order a lens that has initially 400 to 450 on eye, just knowing that I'm going to get settling with time. And then when they come back for their first follow-up after they've been dispensed the lens, assuming everything looks right, I usually ask them to have the lens on for at least three hours prior to coming back in so we can really assess full settling. Very good. Thank you for that answer. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Baldwin. He's got two uh, slightly more complicated cases to show you kind of you know, stretch the legs of end lens a little bit. And, and Bruce, if you wouldn't mind while you're going through this, can you touch on how you're using OCT? Uh, in your fitting. That was one of the questions that just came in. Thanks. I sure will. Thanks. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Uh, or maybe it's good uh, good afternoon or maybe even good morning, depending on where you're dialed in from. Uh, let me thank uh, the folks at Alvin, in particular President uh, Tom Schoen and John Davis for inviting me. And uh, uh, thanks to you, Dr. Jason Jedlicka, for asking me to present a couple of case reports tonight. Mm -hmm. Next. So I have had the opportunity to fit uh, a few Zen lenses. I fit a couple of herpes scars, a several keratoconus patients, a pellucid, a couple of uh, irregular astigmatism from various causes, uh, some dry eye, one Sjogren's patients. I fit an intact patient, a uh, person with really serious uh, LASIK ectasia that couldn't see with glasses, and uh, several corneal grafts, and now three normal corneas. And I put normal in quotes. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So. Tonight I'm going to uh, present uh, uh, two cases, and we'll start with the, uh, a PK. So this lady uh, had a PK in her right eye in, in 2006 by a local provider. And if you look at the picture on the right, you'll see the graft is decentered just a little bit. And if you look at the topos on the left, you'll, she has what I call a warped graft. It's really steep inferior and really flat superior, and that's probably why her best corrected uh, glasses vision is only 2100. Uh, note the lens she's wearing right there. The arrow, go back one, please. Uh, the arrow is pointing to the edge of that lens. That's a 13.5 a 13 millimeter uh, semi-scleral she's been wearing for about three years. And we're just having some trouble with it, so I wanted to refit her into a Zen lens. Next. So this is an image of the trial lens. I do not have uh, an image of her final lenses, but this is a trial lens. This is the oblate design. 17 millimeters, it's a 5100 micron sag, and that's a little bit too much sag. Uh, we just had a question about how, how long do you let lens settle. Uh, I just assume for most people it's going to sell about 100 and ordered a little bit more sag than I want. Unless somebody is, uh, has some special eye or maybe they're from five hours away, and sometimes I'll put the lens on, send them to lunch, and have them come back, but I typically just assume uh, it's going to settle. I order a little bit more sagittal depth, but even with that in mind, if you look on the image on the right, that's a little too much sagittal depth. So for the final lens, once you see the parameters below, I decrease the sagittal depth by 100 microns. And note that the base curve changed also so that we could get nearly a plano overcorrection. Uh, her glasses that she wore over her contact lenses 
uh, was nearly plano, and so with this way she would not have to change her glasses prescription. Okay, next. So while I had her in the clinic, I wanted to put both the prolate and oblate designs on just so I could see what they looked like on her eye. Above is the prolate design and below the oblate. They have almost the same sagittal depth. The prolate is 5200 microns and the oblate is 5100. And you can see by the image it's very clear in the lower image that there is a lot more limbal clearance with the oblate design. And those of you that have fit a lot of scleral lenses know that uh, getting really good clearance out there at the limbus can be one of the biggest problems we have. And I think this oblate design uh, solves a lot of those problems. Also notice that the over-refraction was very different in the two. Next. Let's look at uh, the same image just blown up a little bit to again show you the increased clearance out at the limbus. And on the right you see your typical uh, slit lamp images also showing that there's more uh, clearance in the lower image from the oblate design. Next. And then one more thing, let's look at the landing. Uh, uh, one more time you can see a lot more clearance out even well beyond the limbus. And even with that very uh, much increased limbal clearance, the landings of the two look very similar. You have very what we call soft or aligned landings and that's, uh, and that's very important. Let me make a note about the two bottle caps. Those were the, uh, in case you're into details, later review on the slides, those were the beta lens parameters and they may be different in your current fitting set. Next. So we'll look at that patient in a little bit more detail. So above are the two trial lenses, the prolate and the oblate designs. Again, very similar sag. But if I were prescribing uh, a, a lens based on either of those trial lenses, with the prolate design, I would need a negative 650 power, final. In the oblate design, I would need a plus 325 power. So that nine diopters of difference in power is driven by the fact that the, uh, the base curve of the oblate design is roughly nine diopters flatter uh, than the prolate design. So the final lens was an oblate, 17 millimeter. Uh, we did uh, decrease the size of depth by about 100, so 5,000. And talking with uh, John Davis at Alden, we uh, changed the base curve so that it would drive the final lens power to be pretty close to Plano, which is what I needed again uh, for her current glasses. And so he was able to keep all the other parameters the same from the trial lens and simply change the base curve and the power, and we ended up with the same sagittal depth. That's a really powerful tool uh, with this lens. Next. So this is not our patient. This is just a few pictures I put in to illustrate that with pellucid marginal degeneration, you often have really, really steep, really inferior ectasia, and uh, those pellucid patients can be really difficult to fit with, a, with any kind of rigid lens, including scleral lenses. If you, if you get enough clearance inferior, sometimes you have way too much superior. But you can see with that oblate as in lens, that's a really, really good fit on that pellucid patient. Next. So now let's switch to normal corneas. And I put normal in quotes because often if you're going to do a scleral lens on a normal eye, it's somebody with a high refractive error or a lot of uh, astigmatism. And this patient fits uh, that description. She's a, a very nice, attractive 46-year-old female. And if you look at her refractive error, she's a high myope with a lot of cylinder. And she does not have cataracts, but she was planning on having cataract surgery simply as a method of refractive surgery because she never could see well with any of the custom soft lenses she had because of the unstable rotation and blurry vision. And uh, here's some images from part of the workup for her cataract surgery. And she was ready to pay greater than $10,000 to have a clear lens uh, uh, exchange. And if you look at the image on the lower left, you'll see the toric intraocular lens that was going to be prescribed had six diopters of uh, tericity to it. But the surgeon asked me if maybe I could try some type of a contact lens, uh, so she um, would choose that instead of the cataract surgery. And next. Indeed, um, she is now wearing the 16 millimeters Zen lens. 
Even with that really high refractive error, look at the final power of the lenses. We're both fairly close to Plano. And she sees pretty good. She does have a little bit of amblyopia in both eyes, but she sees uh, really, really good, and, and she's happy with that vision. Next. So that was just a sort of a quick normal cornea. Let's do another normal cornea and go into a little bit more detail. This is a 27-year-old professional male, and he's never been able to wear soft contact lenses because of dry eye. And we found out during the workup that he has uh, some residual lenticular astigmatism, and that's probably why he's been told that he can't wear uh, rigid lenses. Next. Here's his manifest refraction. He's got a little bit of cylinder. He has really good 2015 vision, which he likes. Uh, however, his uh, Ks are nearly spherical, indicating that almost all of that cylinder uh, is lenticular. Next. Here's the first lens that we dispensed. It's a prolate design, Zen lens, a 17 millimeter design. There's the other parameters you can see. However, when we did the follow-up, it looked like the uh, resonant that uh, actually fit the lens underestimated the amount of vault that was needed. However, the power was right and everything else seemed to be right. Um, so we just wanted to order basically the same lens and increase the sagittal depth. Next. So the new lens was ordered, increasing the sagittal depth by 150. So we went from 5,000 microns to, uh, to 5,150 microns. Again, keeping the other parameters the same, diameter, base curve, and power. I did also, on just the right lens, order the uh, flat one periphery just to see if I could get a little improved uh, tear exchange. So here's the first remake. Uh, again, it's, it was the same as the original lens, only the sagittal depth was increased by 150. And if you look at the, the lower left images, you'll see that we indeed did get about 100, a little more than 100 microns of increased clearance, which we wanted. However, uh, none of these lenses we dispensed could you see uh, quite 2020. It was a little fuzzy 2020. And so I realized that on both of these dispensings, the resident had only done a spherical overcorrection. So this time we did a spheral cylinder overcorrection, and you can see we got about a hundred, uh, one and a quarter doctors of residual astigmatism for both eyes, and he got that good 2015 vision that he wanted. So we want to now order uh, a toric. Uh, toric um, optics, toric powers in the lenses. So like previous, we could keep most everything the same and just order the uh, toric, front toric powers. There was a, a toric haptic put on the lens also for, uh, for stability. And uh, these are the lenses we dispensed. He was 2015 with each eye. Uh, the over refraction was nearly plano with, over, with each eye. And uh, I saw him with the lenses on and off several times over several days, and the rotational stability was really, really good. Next. So uh, John Davis uh, there at Alden tells me that they, uh, they get uh, rotational stability from the uh, double thin zone type of a design. And here are images of the vertical and the horizontal uh, landing zones of the lens. And you can see the vertical uh, edge of the lens is a little bit thinner and the horizontal is a little bit thicker. And somehow or another, that's John and Alden's magic to keep that lens stable so you can put front toric optics on the lens and have it be stable and have very good vision. Next. And so here's our patient uh, wearing his uh, uh, Zen lens on his normal cornea with residual lenticular astigmatism that's fully corrected uh, with the Zen lens. So that's all I have, but uh, Tom wanted me to uh, mention something about using OCT for evaluating and fitting scleral lenses, and I get that question asked a lot. For me, I happen to have one in the clinic because I'm at a university, and so it was conveniently available. And I can tell you that uh, for the first year or so, I was taking OCT images of most all of my scleral lens patients, and it helped me learn, but I learned very fast, 
and I rarely use uh, the anterior segment OCT now for fitting. About the only time I use it now if I want to take a picture that I can put uh, in a slide. Very good, Bruce. Thank you very much for the two, three interesting cases and, and touching on it. OCT question. We, uh, we're fortunate to have a special guest uh, in attendance tonight. Uh, Dr. Melissa Barnett at UC Davis is on, is on the line listening in. Dr. Barnett was a, was a very uh, high-level participant in our beta study, and she just wanted to jump in. I'm going to take her off mute here right now, jump in and talk about one, one, quickly about one case she had actually today. Melissa. Well, thanks for having me. Um, this has been a great lens to be working with, and it's been a problem solver some, for some patients. So today I had a patient who has Salzman's nodular degeneration, and she was previously in scleral lenses, but she was having some irritation and problems, so I switched her to the Zen lens, and really kind of amazing. On the first lens I ordered, it, the lens was clearing the nodules, great vision, 20-20 each eye, great comfort, and seeing her back today for her check, I was just impressed with how good her eyes looked. The lens was fitting very nicely, and she's very, very happy. So thanks for having me. That's a great story, Melissa. Thanks for sharing that. I appreciate it. Okay, John, you want to hit the next slide for me, please? So we're going to wrap up. I appreciate everybody's time. We're a little over the hour. We tried really hard to keep this within an hour, but there's a lot of good things to talk about with Zen Lens. I think today you've uh, hopefully uh, seen some evidence that fundamentally we think we've got a really interesting and well-designed scleral lens with great landing zones uh, and, and really nice uh, treatment of peripheral curves. Uh, all in, our beta fitters, our preview fitters, everybody seems to be pretty happy with a 16 and 17 millimeter approach to cover a wide range of corneal sizes. And of course, everybody went into great detail about the advantages of having both prolate and oblate designs uh, in your 24 lens set. Um, we're excited about what the smart curve can do and the ability to zero in on a parameter change and not have to chase your tail uh, dealing with uh, ancillary changes as you, as you try to fine tune the fit. And I think that we've also demonstrated that Zen Lens has got the power to do a lot of custom work um, and do some interesting things with um, different peripheral curves and front torque optics and flexure control and things like that. And uh, last but not least, our 24 lens diagnostic set we, we think is, is, is really well designed and I think that was, that was some feedback we got in beta. So again, I want to thank you for your time and attention.